faithwire.com. Hello and welcome to 4 and 3, a podcast breaking down four of the most important stories of the day and three things you need to know about them all from a Christian perspective. Today is Wednesday, March 10th, 2021. It's a special day, Trey. It is Texas Pandemic Independence Day. Oh. Yes, celebrate it. I'm what Dan Andros. Day. I'm Dan Andros, and coming up on the podcast today, a pastor goes viral for claiming a passage in Mark chapter 7 makes Jesus racist. A uh, study calls for uh, more beloved Dr. Seuss books to be canceled. Beth Moore announces she's done with the SBC. And Mumford and Sons, a bandmate, apologizes, steps away from the group for tweeting about a book critical of Antifa. He was praising the book that was criticizing Antifa. Now, he's the one getting canceled in all this. It's crazy town as usual, Trey. But on the positive note today, it is Texas Pandemic Independence Day, March 10th. Um, now, yes. now, in, look, I know Texas is very proud of this fact today. Um, but I will point out that Governor Christy Noem up in South Dakota is sitting there going, well, this, has been, this has been every day for us since right. this whole thing started. I don't think uh, they ever had any mandates in place, did they? No, I don't think so. And Oklahoma, I think, was similar. And the, they obviously encouraged people to take responsibility, similar to what Nome has done. But I don't yeah. think either of those two states uh, have ever, ever had uh, like really strict lockdowns. Definitely not any lockdowns. And I don't think they've had any mask mandates either. Right. And again, you're right. They don't say that's not they're, they're not saying, hey, everyone go around and, you know, um, lick doorknobs and stuff. Like nobody's saying that. They're, they're, Which, they're darn, saying, that used to be a pastime of mine. I know, but uh, they, you know, encourage responsibility, as you said, and uh, didn't have the government clamp down on them. So yeah. that should be a win-win. Of course, everybody gets mad because that's just what we do now. Apparently, in 2021, everybody gets mad. So, yes. <laughs> all right, let's uh, let's kick it right off. And story number one: an openly gay pastor named Brandon Robertson. Went viral on TikTok talk for claiming that Jesus was essentially racist, who a racist who had to repent of his sin. He's discussing Mark chapter 7 when Jesus interacts with a Syrophoenician woman. Uh, we might be familiar with that story, but uh, here, uh, here is uh, this pastor explaining uh, his take. Uh, on that uh, on that passage. Did you know that there's a part of the Gospel of Mark where Jesus uses a racial slur? In Mark chapter 7, there's the account of the Seraphonician woman, a woman who is Syrian and Greek, both of which there were strong biases against within the Jewish community. And she comes to ask Jesus to heal her daughter who's possessed by a demon. And what is Jesus's response? He says, it's not good for me to give the children's food, meaning the children of Israel's food, to dogs. He calls her a dog. What's amazing about this account is that the woman doesn't back down. She speaks truth to power. She confronts Jesus and says, well, you can think that about me, but even dogs deserve the crumbs from the table. Her boldness and bravery to speak truth to power actually changes Jesus' mind. Jesus repents of his racism and extends healing to this woman's mm. daughter. I love this story because it's a reminder that Jesus is human. He had prejudices and bias, and when confronted with it, he was willing to do his work. And this woman was willing to stand up and speak truth. Jesus did the work. Oh my goodness! <laughs> there's there's so much going on there, uh, and so it's hard to even know where to begin. But uh, the responses have been swift. What's the left saying? Well, uh, uh, I haven't seen a lot of support for this, but Rachel Held Evans made a similar argument uh, a couple years ago. Then she ended up coming out and saying, you know, she apologized, said she didn't believe Jesus sinned, etc. But you know, she kind of made the same point. Um, but what's the right saying? Well, one response caught my eye. This was James White, who's a prominent theologian, pastor, author, very skilled debater. Um, the guy knows his stuff, but uh, he's been a pastor for a long time. And um, he kind of explained that abandoning this uh, orthodoxy of Christianity is an inevitable outcome hmm. when you abandon the authority of an inerrancy of scripture in favor of other ideologies, namely like the woke woke type thinking of today. So he was kind of talking about that from an umbrella perspective and how we should respond yeah. to these things. So here's a part of his response to uh, to this pastor, who he's familiar with. He had known this who this guy was from years ago, so he'd seen the progression over time. But so with that context, here's what James White said. But what this man just said was that Jesus is not a savior, can't be a savior. He's a sinner. 
He's a racist. He's not as good as a Syrophoenician woman. She had to speak, speak truth to power. He's not the truth. He's not the way. He's not the life. He's not the savior. He was a lie from the beginning, but he'll still call himself a Christian. When I first heard him, he would have would have just recoiled from that. But the process is inevitable because the foundation was gone. He had embraced a lifestyle and an identity that necessitated the incoherence of the biblical revelation that brought conviction to his heart. So once he got rid of that, the rest of it's going to fall by the wayside. There is no reason to believe in the doctrine of the Trinity if the Bible is not a divine revelation from God. Hmm. There isn't any. Yeah, so that, that was kind of the comment I wanted to zero in on. I mean, because he was talking about we shouldn't be re responding emotionally to these things. We should think presuppositionally. And and, and his, his point was basically that you need to go to the foundations of these things because so many people are abandoning the foundations of Scripture uh, and so you're arguing these sort of side points and you're not arguing on the same foundation. So um, so that's kind of why I think it matters is that, uh, as White pointed out, you know, we're seeing more and more people like this sort of abandoning these Orthodox Christian teachings. And what is the reason for that? You know, and a lot of that is they're adopting these woke policies that are just incongruent <laughs> with Scripture. And once you adopt those, it's it's a logical outcome that down the road at some point, you know, you're just going to have to abandon the teachings you're, yeah. you're gonna have to you're gonna come to a fork in the road and you're just gonna have to choose and so i think that's more and more prevalent today and that's what that's why it matters because as christians we got to know this stuff is going on because um you know pastor white said it he said that if you believe that the bible is the inerrant revealed word of god divinely revealed word of god that you're in the minority even as christians yeah. you're in the minority today yeah i think the scary thing about critical theory and this woke culture, this woke revolution, I guess you could say that we're in, is that it forces people really to become ideological nomads mm -hmm. because no matter no matter what structure you believe in, at the end of the day, that's you have to believe that that's what it is. It's just a structure. It's yeah. a construct that was built and designed uh, to prop up the white supremacist culture or uh, oppressive culture to to continue to allow the oppressor to oppress. You know, however you want to phrase it, uh, that ends up having to be the the lens through which mm -hmm. you see everything, and you can't. The Christian can't see that have that philosophy for everything else but keep scripture over in a corner protected by itself eventually it's going to come for scripture uh, if you apply it to every other facet of your yeah. life yeah uh, and you know the christian like we have to look at the world through the lens of of what scripture says which is you know in the beginning was the word and the word was god mm -hmm. that jesus's word made flesh okay so if jesus and the word are the <laughs> same thing if they are one and the same i have to look at the world through that lens and, and see critical theory woke culture politics everything through that lens because when i allow it when i flip it uh, then this is the end result. Like, you know, what uh, James White says, eventually it has to come for your faith. Mm -hmm. Your faith can't be an island all to itself uh, when, and you know, protected uh, over over there in the corner, like I said, uh, if you're going to have this kind of worldview, eventually it's going to come for your faith. Yeah, no, great points. And, and I think we have to just discern as Christians, you know, be careful when, you know, these different ideologies come along and critical theory, especially when it's got a whole framework and everything, yeah. If it's going to take you off of the gospel and move you into it, like you said, a different lens to see the world through, you really got to be careful there. I mean, that's really dangerous territory that you're going into. And um, I think people are right to uh, to be concerned about it. Yeah, for sure. All right. Story number two. So uh, the study that reportedly sparked the decision uh, earlier this month by Read Across America and possibly Dr. Seuss Enterprises uh, to re-examine the books written by uh, the late children's author suggested that pretty much all of his books, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, should be canceled <laughs> due to elements of racism and sexism. The study, which was titled The Cat is Out of the Bag, Orientalism, Anti-Blackness, and White Supremacy in Dr. Seuss's Children's Books, was uh, actually released in 2019. Uh, and it, the, the crux of its argument, or at least one of the, the main points, uh, criticisms for Dr. Seuss's books, was that only 2% of the human characters in Seuss's books are ethnicities other than white. 
of course, Dan, we would be uh, remiss if we didn't <laughs> know that the vast majority of Dr. Seuss's characters <laughs> are not human. No, so. <laughs> they're very weird things. Uh, and they're not even animals that exist. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're just made up creatures. Uh. Uh, but, you know, set that aside for a minute. So uh, <laughs> the, the study's authors wrote, of the 45 characters of color, 43 are identified as having characteristics aligning with the definition of Orientalism. Uh, you know, 14 of the people who are uh, Oriental, uh, according to the study, are identified by stereotypical East Asian characteristics, and 29 of the characters uh, are wearing turbans, uh, which is offensive. Uh, only two of the 45 characters are identified in the text as African, and both align with the themes of anti-blackness, whatever that means. Uh, white supremacy is seen through the centering of whiteness and white characters, who comprise 98% of all characters. Notably, every character of color is male, and males of color are only presented in subservient, exotified, and dehumanized roles. Uh, the study also dislikes Horton Hears a, he Horton Hears a Who, uh, despite the fact that it was written, uh, like we talked about when all this Seuss stuff first came up, uh, it was written as a, a, a sort of apology by Dr. Seuss uh, for his earlier characterization of uh, Japanese people during World War II. Uh, Horton Hears a Who is... is I mean, really, if you boil it down, is about standing up for people who can't stand up for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, but the author said that that book reinforces themes of white supremacy, Orientalism, and white saviorism. <clears throat> and you really can't make this line up. Uh, the, the study's authors concluded that Horton, quote, enacts the white savior industrial complex. Oh, my goodness. Horton is, of course, an <laughs> elephant who I believe is orange. Um, so they also see problems oh. with Cat in the Hat, uh, claiming that the cat was, quote, inspired by blackface performances, oh, white uh, racist images in popular culture, and actual African Americans. So what's the left saying? Well, for the left, this is about creating a safe space. Uh, it all goes back to the critical theory stuff, which is rooted in Marxist thinking that you know, divides the world neatly between two categories the oppressed and the oppressors. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Democrats have made the case of this kind of censorship of Seuss's books. Uh, six have been canceled, uh, like we talked about earlier. We have stories on that at faithwire.com. Uh, it's not a big deal, and conservatives are overreacting. Uh, AOC earlier, you know, before any of this Seuss stuff, has also called for a government commission uh, to regulate media and information and misinformation. Uh, so, yeah, the left doesn't see a lot of problems with the, this sort of... Uh, overreach or, you know, censorship right. of, of content. Uh, so what's the right saying? Well, conservatives have taken issue with this and have raised concerns about the censorship, censorship of books. Uh, ben Shapiro, uh, the founder of the Daily Wire uh, podcast host, he's repeatedly, repeatedly likened it to like a digital book burning, essentially, yeah. uh, these days. Uh, so why does it matter? Well, this matters because it's about something that's much larger than Dr. Seuss. Uh, conservatives, and particularly Christians, have to stand up to, to critical theory because like we talked about with the previous story, it's, it's anathema to the gospel. Mm. Uh, it reduces people to nothing more than the complexion of their skin. Uh, and it's nearly impossible. I, I, I've realized Dan to have a conversation with a critical theorist, yep. uh, because given they believe that the world is split between oppressors and the oppressed, uh, you know, the, the oppressors uh, are, are, always committed to just maintaining the tyrannical supremacy uh, and the oppressed are morally superior just by virtue of being uh, oppressed. Uh, so any criticisms of those who perceive themselves to be oppressed are, are immediately just dismissed yeah. uh, because it's a nefarious attempt uh, by the supposed oppressors to maintain their perceived supremacy. <laughs> uh, so I, I have to admit, it's a pretty good way of, of never having to engage yeah. in any real dialogue. Yeah, they've created a nice little vicious uh, circle for for themselves to not yeah. be in, and the other side is just stuck in it, and they can't get out. And um, you know, Tim Keller wrote a really great piece. Uh, hmm. I think our own uh, Sarah Laughlin sent it to me a while back. But, yes, but he criticized, and I mean, he went into depth on it. But um, he, one of the areas he zoomed in on was th this idea here that you can't, you know, that power is what really determines racism. You know, you can't be racist unless you have the power. Those who, uh, you know, that's why they'll all often say that only whites are all racist. It's yeah. because they are perceived to have the power. And his point was, well, what happens when the power shifts? Yeah. You know, if if the current minorities that are oppressed then, you know, fight in this struggle and then they get the power, right? Yeah. You know, because that's a lot of the solution is, well, you have to step down, step down from your power, give it to someone else. Now, are you then racist once you have the power? Yeah. 
Because it's, well, it's this self-defeating system that whoever's in power is automatically racist, and then now the other people are the ones that are struck. So <laughs> that's a vicious loop right there. You're just going to keep changing power. Oh, they're the racists now. Uh, I guess we're all bad. We'll give it back to you. Oh, wait, yeah. guess what? You're in power. Now you're the racist now. So it, it just uh, it seems to be illogical and self-defeating. Yeah. And we're, I mean, we're seeing that now with people, you know, the, the far, far left looking back in hindsight of, of seeing Obama's presidency. And that's kind of what they're contending with now. It's like, well, we did have a, you know, a black president, uh, an African-American president who was in term, you know, in, in office for eight years, two terms. Uh, but the argument now from, like I said, the far left is, yeah, but he didn't go far enough. He just kind of propped up the system. He was, he became a, a cog in yeah. this system of supremacy, of, of white supremacy, uh, because all of our structures and institutions are, you know, by design, yeah. uh, white supremacist, uh, so which is also interesting it, yeah. uh, because during Trump's presidency, there was so much criticism from the left that Trump was undermining our institutions uh, right. But but also the institutions are so, inherently evil. Right. So don't, so would, don't we want them undermined? Wouldn't that be a good thing? Yeah, I never thought about it that way. Um, one, one other thing, real quick, Trey, before we move on, because I know we've gone long on the first two here, but am I, I'm, I feel like really dumb because I never looked this far into any Dr. Seuss books as a kid or as a parent reading them to my kids. They just yeah. were books that rhymed a lot. And, yeah, uh, that was... You yeah. know, and I didn't really... I didn't... <laughs> I mean... I don't know. I just was not seeing the. I mean, I didn't read all of them. I read a couple, you know, the cat in the hat and the obvious ones. But uh, anyway, I just, you know, you kind of like yurtle the turtle. Like, I, I just yeah. honestly, like, I'm not the biggest fan of the, all of those books. Like, they were just annoying to read. Like, I kind of want to just get my <laughs> kid to bed, you know, and I'd, yeah. I'd like be skipping over a lot of the rhymes and just kind of paraphrasing them and shortening them. So I don't know. Well, maybe I'm know, just suppose- maybe I'm just not smart. I suppose you're skipping over some of the rhymes because you didn't want your kids to be, you know, too tyrannical. Yeah. So yeah. You, you had to skip over some of the lines to like soften the blow. <laughs> right. They're already automatically going to be oppressors. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to make them not as bad, benevolent so, oppressors, if if you will. <laughs> yeah. No, I, yeah, I'm the same way. I, don't, I read them growing up. Actually, I really liked a lot of them uh, because yeah. I do think a lot of them have, especially as an adult, have a lot of really good moral uh, yeah. moral applications to them. But as a kid, yeah, I, it was just a book that rhymed. Like I, I wasn't <laughs> learning any sort of nefarious or, or good yeah. lesson from them. It was just a neutral, you know, it's a book that rhymes. It's a, yeah. it's a good way to fall asleep at night. <laughs> well, as a tired parent, I just tried to get through them. I didn't really do much thinking. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway. All right. Story number three. Moving on, Beth Moore announced that she will no longer be part of the Southern Baptist Convention. I'm still a Baptist, more more clarified, but I can no longer identify with Southern Baptists. I love so many Southern Baptist people, so many Southern Baptist churches, but I don't identify with some of the things in our heritage that haven't remained in the past. Um, the breakup between Moore's Living Proof Ministries and Lifeway was reported, reportedly uh, amicable. Becky Lloyd, Lifeway's uh, director um, for women's director there, said the organization will continue to work with more and still sell some of her books and promote some events hosted by her. Um, she said their relationship is not over. Uh, we continue to love, pray, and support Beth uh, for years to come. We will do that. So, um, so that was what uh, uh, she said. Um, what's the left saying about this? Well, progressive Christians have responded with a lot of praise for the move. Unsurprisingly, the right. Right-leaning Christians are saying, ah, we saw this one coming. Here's the first step out the door. Um, so why does it matter? Well, well, Moore has a ton of followers. And, um, you know, again, we've talked a lot about theological foundations here. So she's been sort of vague. I mean, she has raised some critical issues and some worthy issues to talk about. But, you know, yeah. she's also kind of dabbled in the waters of critical theory a little bit. But she's she's been pretty vague Um a lot on in public on social media in her critiques so um you know so so i think she's kind of i'd categorize her tray as sort of a a tbd let's wait and see mm-hmm. but she does have a lot of a huge influence a lot of christian followers and so i think that's why it matters what she does just because yeah so many christians are sort of following her lead yeah i mean and i think there is merit to the fact that or to the argument that she's you know one of the most if not the most uh prominent uh, Southern Baptist 
yeah. definitely woman in the sure. United States. Uh, so, you know, it, 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 it's important in that sense. Uh, but I also, I wrote this in our, our write up on this at faithwire.com. The thing that's so frustrating to me is that the only reason the media cares one scintilla about this <laughs> is because she's been willing to criticize uh, now former president Trump. Yeah. Uh, and she's kind of, of she, she's been uh, compassionate toward, uh, uh, concerns regarding uh, racism that the only that is the only reason right it fits the uh, narrative it fits the media narrative so you... none of these people really care I mean it's, no. it's, Beth, it's Beth Moore she's a prominent evangelical uh, Bible teacher and author I mean come on it's right. just it's so patently absurd and just I don't know it, well, that's, that's what angers me yeah. more than more yeah well and that's no totally totally I mean I think Moore has been fine on this I just yeah, think I, a lot sure. of eyeballs on it right now that's why it matters so but um, but yeah, you, you look at people like um, the, the the pastors like Jeffress who supported Trump, they're going to get in the headlines because just because of that. That's why. And so uh, until they do that, they're going to remain ignored by the media. And so that's the other thing is that Christianity unfairly oftentimes gets painted with a broad brush based on what the media finds interesting. And usually it's because they speak out on one of their pet issues. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I guess my only hope is, is that I think more, uh, you know, Beth Moore with the, the foundations of the faith, I think she's spot on on that stuff. Yeah. And maybe these uh, journalists, if they continue to follow her, they may, maybe they'll get a, a exposure to some of that uh, because she, she does have a great ministry and I don't know. I guess that's the silver lining is maybe if they start paying attention to her, they'll keep paying attention. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. So story number four, uh, Winston Marshall, the banjo player in Mumford and Sons, has publicly apologized and even announced a hiatus from the band, uh, all because he posted a tweet uh, about a book written by journalist Andy No, uh, who is critical of uh, and working to expose Antifa. Uh, Marshall wrote in his apology, I have offended not only a lot of people I don't know, but also those closest to me, including my bandmates, and for that I am truly sorry. As a result of my actions, I am taking time away from the band mm. to examine my blind spots. I, his actions, <laughs> I just, his I can't actions, even. I know. He tweeted a book saying that Andy No is brave uh, as, a, <laughs> as an Asian gay man. Right. right to stand up to a violent mob of people. Yeah, I mean, that's his claim to fame, right? I mean, he's he got beat nearly to death, suffered a brain <sighs> injury because of a crazy group yes. of uh, anarchists. Yes, they, they threw a, a milkshake cup full of concrete at his head that caused a brain bleed. But I'm sorry for promoting Andy No here and saying something nice about him. I mean, it's just, I mean, we are living in La La Land. So uh, what's the left saying? Well, uh, I mean, not a lot of like prominent Democrats have, have responded to this particular instance, but leftists on social media uh, have condemned Marshall as a, quote, Nazi who, quote, likes fascist propaganda. Uh, again, all because he just said that he enjoyed the book unmasked, uh, and called no a brave man. <laughs> Fascist so, propaganda. That's, I mean, what's the right saying? Oh. Well, Andy no responded Wednesday morning to the news in a tweet. Uh, he wrote, I grieve for those who are made to suffer because they dare to read my book or talk to me. The danger of Antifa and their allies is not only their willingness to carry out or support maiming, killing, and terrorism, but also how they close curious minds from independent thought. Uh, Ali Stuckey gave her advice to Marshall, tweeting, Your apology to the mob will never be enough. Your best options are to ignore them or double down. Mm. Uh, and she's exactly right. Yep. I mean, we have President Biden is during a debate. He said he refused to even condemn Antifa. He said, oh, there's nothing more than an ideology. <laughs> right. Uh, so that's, you know, keep that in mind that that's kind of the, the message from the left. Uh, so why does it matter? Well, like I said, Ali is 100 percent right. That, and that's why this story matters. We're sort of in a catch 22. You know, people, uh, they're kind of damned if they do and damned if they don't. Uh, in this situation, because there, you know, a lot of people are waiting in corporations, big mi businesses, et cetera, to to do the right thing mm. uh, by protecting their clients and empl employees. But I, I just don't, I don't see that incentive there. I don't see that happening. Uh, I might be wrong, but I, I just really don't see that happening. At least not in the in the short term. Uh, individuals are going to have to stand up, even though it's going to cost them greatly, uh, because that's that's the only way to stop this this toxic critical theory from spreading further than it already has. And you know, the sad thing is that each time a, a, somebody like Marshall 
uh, kowtows by apologizing and then disappearing themselves, uh, the critical theorists uh, get a little bit stronger, you know, because mm. uh, they've gotten themselves another scalp. Yeah. Uh, you know, in effect, even if it's not their intention, when people respond like the Mumford and Sons uh, bandmate has, uh, in effect, they're endorsing critical race theory and critical yeah. theory writ large, even if they don't mm-hmm. believe it, yeah. because they're saying, you know, there must be merit to this. It must be true. So I'm going to take a hiatus and uh, and apologize for my actions. And your actions. He, yeah, that's, that's he posted that's a, a single one. tweet, which he <laughs> since deleted. <laughs> right. And the and again, the actions, I mean. If anything, now he should have to apologize again because, I mean, think about offensive. Is it? Imagine if that was you. If you're Andy No, right? This is not just some, you know, cartoon character out there that you don't know or not familiar with. It's you, and yeah. you've done nothing but, you know, express your own, you know, opinion about something you have a personal experience with, which isn't really mm-hmm. controversial. That Antifa's nuts and that he got attacked by them because he reports on them, and then yeah. Now you get canceled. Now you're getting, someone has to apologize for simply saying something nice to you. Like, yeah. how does that make you feel? How does that make you and, feel as an individual? It's got to make you feel horrible. Oh, I, awful. And, uh, you know, Andy No was actually on Megan Kelly's podcast uh, not that long ago. And he was talking about his own struggle with depression mm. uh, when he was younger and his own struggle, even with it now, with just his mental health. But this kind of stuff just makes it patently obvious that the far left couldn't care less about your mental health if you don't fit into their ideological yeah. mold. Yep. Uh, because this is not, I mean, essentially what we're doing is not only are we bullying uh, mm. the the bandmate for uh, for Mumford and Sons, we're, we're using, we're essentially having a proxy war, right? Like this is this is actually about Andy No. Uh, and that's who the, the far left is going after, but they're right. just using Marshall mm-hmm. as, as a proxy. Uh, for him. And I mean, if this was anybody else, if this was somebody on the left, we would be clearly condemning this because it it is harmful to somebody's mental health, particularly someone who struggles with depression uh, and their self-worth and their identity, uh, you know, their self-esteem. It's just, uh, it's just so sad that this, this is what we're okay with culturally. Right. And yeah, as Christians, you know, fear, intimidation, bullying um, are things that just run counter to the gospel and yeah how can you stand for this how how can you stand for just this mentality um to just play whack-a-mole and anyone you disagree with you just whack them down uh and delete them it's just uh it's not right and um we got to keep praying and doing the work so to speak to uh, (laughs) head in the (laughs) other direction so god bless you thanks for listening we'll see you back here tomorrow